since served in a variety of teaching leadership capacities. Souls had a great love for the Book of Moses, and during a recent sabbatical in France, determined to return to his study in earnest. The result of detailed commentary analysis entitled In God's Image and Likeness is led for publication by Great Folk Books in late, late 2009. We have flyers on the book out there, and I'm going to turn the time over to Jeff Bradshaw. Hold the rating a little bit. Oh, there we are. Let me just tell you, like uh, Scott said, um, this uh, we have a, both some flyers and an early, early copy of the book out on the table in the bookstore. Uh, this is a tome of about a thousand pages. It will come out next um, uh, August, about this time, um, on the Book of Moses. Uh, my wife calls it uh, everything you could ever conceivably want to know about the Book of Moses and more. So, uh, I should also acknowledge my family who's here, as, as Scott mentioned, I've, I've written and spoken quite a bit in, in my own professional areas, but this is the first time I've really given a talk of this nature in an LDS setting. Um, my uh, sister who's here in back, Bonnie Robinson, maybe raise your hand, Bonnie, is also an author and has helped me sort of sort out uh, some things having to do with this book. My brother, John, actually uh, created this very handsome cover. Uh, for the book, uh, it's been a little bit of a family thing, and I should also say he actually designed as an architect the South Town Center where we're meeting, where we're meeting right now. This was an award-winning building, uh, really an imitation of the Wasatch Mountains in the back. He's done a lot of other very interesting buildings all around the world. Uh, my son Thomas, our resident uh, linguist and traveling companion, is here too from BYU, and uh, my son Thomas also contributed. He and I stayed up all night trying to get a rough version of the typesetting right before I came. And I noticed just as I got to Salt Lake that he'd inserted something the night before into the uh, uh, acknowledgments. He said, it said, Samuel Bradshaw has sacrificed more than 85 hours of his summer vacation to write this book. <laughs> Kid you not, you can find the acknowledgments out there. Anyway, it's great to be here. I, I wear this tie deliberately. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, uh, I did have somebody who correctly identified it as Starry Night by Van Gogh, and so that's a very, very well-informed answer. If you say it's the creation of the universe, which is kind of what it evokes to me, that's fine. If um, you say it's Hurricane Ivan barreling towards Florida, I will know you from the Florida panhandle, like my good friends the Clarks who are here. Anyway, let me just go on then and... Uh, with what I'm calling the message of the Joseph Smith translation, A Walk in the Garden. Kind of a strange title. I think it took Scott back when I gave him such a strange title in, in lieu of the one I'd originally came up with. But let me try to explain. I'm really taking a perspective a little bit narrow uh, to, to make some points here today. And really the title I have to give with an apology to Hugh Nibley, who created a very brilliant book on how um, the message of the Joseph Smith papyri as Joseph Smith, as Nibley argued, the papyri associated with the Book of Abraham could be seen as an Egyptian endowment. So I'd like to consider with you the possibility that the commission of Joseph Smith to translate the Bible, as much as anything else, was an opportunity for the prophet to be tutored in temple-related doctrines. Following a brief discussion of this conjecture, we'll look a little more closely at some selected themes from the Book of Moses. The placement of the Book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price obscures the fact that it's really uh, I'm, it's placement of the Book of Mormon in the Pearl of Great Price really obscures placement of the Book of Moses obscures the fact that it's really the first part of the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, or JST. This is the first, first page of the manuscript of Moses chapter 1, dated June 1830, a time of great exuberance in the church, but also a period of intense persecution for Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. Like many of the prophet's revelations, the manuscript appears to have been flowingly dictated in a single setting, that the prophet could find the time, strength, and energy, and inspiration necessary to receive and record this beautiful and complex account of this visions of Moses during such a busy and difficult period is a wonder to me. Though apparently the Lord did not find it imperative that the JST be published during the prophet's lifetime, the revelations make it clear that it was an urgent priority that the prophet undertake the translation itself. Why was this so? The focus of Joseph Smith's effort, which provides clues to the answer to this question, is made apparent by a quick look at the overall translation results and schedule. A clear priority was accorded to the book of Genesis, especially for the first 24 chapters. 
Strikingly, more than half the changed verses in the JST Old Testament and 20% of those in the whole JST Bible are contained in Moses 1 and Genesis. As a proportion of page count, changes in Genesis occurred four times more frequently than in the New Testament and 21 more times more frequently than elsewhere in the Old Testament. The changes in Genesis are not only more numerous, but also more significant in the degree of doctrinal and historical expansion. When we look at translation time rather than page count, the view is pretty similar. By mid-1833, three years after the commencement of the translation, the prophet felt that the, the book was ready to be published. Uh, the proportions of the left represent the known durations of periods when each part of the translation was completed, with the first 24 chapters of Genesis occupying 24% of the total time for the entire Bible. Though we cannot know how much of Joseph Smith's daily schedule the translation occupied during each of its phases, it is obvious from that Genesis 1 through 24, the first 1% of the Bible, received a significantly higher share of the prophet's attention than the remaining 99%. What important things could Joseph Smith have learned from translating Genesis 1 through 24? To begin with, the story of Enoch and his righteous city would have had pressing relevance to the mission of the church as the prophet tried to work to help the saints understand the law of consecration to establish Zion in Missouri. And it is no coincidence that that account was first published in 1832 and 1833. However, we should not allow the salience of these immediate events to overshadow the fact that the first JST chapters also relate the stories of the patriarchs, especially Adam, Noah, Melchizedek, and Abraham. In consideration of this fact and other evidence from revelations and teachings of this period, I've come to believe that the most significant aspect of the translation process as a whole was the early tutoring and temple-related doctrines received by Joseph Smith as he revised and expanded Genesis 1 through 24 in conjunction with later translation of relevant passages in the New Testament and, for example, the stories of Moses and Elijah. Although I cannot undertake a detailed argument for this today, you can see the book for more on this, I also believe that the proportions of JST published in the Book of Moses throw much more light on temple themes than has usually been supposed, and that their relevance goes far beyond the obvious passages on the creation, the fall, and the early events in the life of Adam and Eve. Under the same spirit of revelation, the, temple, the Book of Moses can be a tutor to us in our day. A corollary in making this argument is that a detailed understanding of the covenants and sequences of blessings accord uh, with current form of LDS temple worship were revealed to Joseph Smith a decade before he began to teach them in plainness to the saints in Nauvoo. It has been generally supposed that in Kirtland the prophet knew only a little bit about temple ordinances and taught all of what he then knew to the saints in Kirtland and that when he got to Nauvoo the rest was revealed to him and he taught them something more there. However, I think such a conclusion is mistaken. My study of the Book of Moses and others of the initial revelations, again, I can't go into all of this here, and teachings of Joseph Smith convinced me that he knew much more early on about these matters than he publicly taught at the time, contradicting the view of those who consider the temple ordinances a late invention. Indeed, in a few cases, we know that the prophet deliberately delayed the publication of temple-related revelations connected with his work on the JST until the Nauvoo period. For example, in Bachman's groundbreaking studies on the origins of DNC 132, which has not only to do with celestial marriage, but the foundations of temple work, we know, uh, Bachman showed that uh, these, this revelation came, uh, the majority of it, during the early years of the translation of the, of the Bible. Some of what, uh, likewise, and so it wasn't published until 1843, likewise, Joseph Smith delayed the publication of Moses chapter 1, which has some very interesting things having to do with the endowment uh, when you look very carefully at the cryptic language there, until 1843, unlike many of the other portions of the, of the book of Moses he, he published previously. Some of, um, in that revelation, Joseph Smith, interestingly, had been commanded not to show it unto any except them that believe until I command you. Some of what the prophet learned as he worked on the JST may have never been put into writing. Brigham Young is remembered as stating that the prophet before his death, quote, spoke about going through the translation of the scriptures again and perfecting it upon points of doctrine which the Lord had restrained him in giving in plainness and fullness at the time. Those Moses 1 and Moses 5 through 8, um, those chapters contain the most new and interesting material from a temple perspective. Today, even though that has the most interesting stuff, I really felt constrained to talk to you about the central chapters in the book of Moses, chapters two through four, the creation, the fall, and so forth. 
uh, the portions which really don't differ very much in Joseph Smith's version than what we have in the Bible. There are significant differences in detail between the stories of creation attributed to Moses and those found in the book of Abraham and in the temple. One reason seems to be that this instruction was given to Moses not primarily to inform him about how the world was made, but rather to show him the pattern for building a temple. Hugh Nibley has famously called the temple a scale model of the universe, and Margaret Barker argues that the very architecture of the tabernacle and the temple of ancient Israel seems to have been a similitude based on Moses' vision of the creation. Lewis Ginsburg reconstruction of several Jewish sources is consistent with this idea. Quote, God told the angels, on the first day of creation, I shall make the heavens and stretch them out. So will Israel raise up the tabernacle as a dwelling place of my glory. On the second day, I shall put a division between the terrestrial waters and the heavenly waters. So will my servant Moses hang up a veil in the tabernacle to divide the holy place from the most holy. On the third day, I shall make the earth to put forth grass and herbs. So will he, in obedience to my commands, prepare shewbread before me. On the fourth day, I shall make the luminaries. So he will stretch out a golden candlestick before me. On the fifth day, I shall create the birds. So he will fashion the cherubim with outstretched wings. On the sixth day, I shall create man. So will Israel set aside a man from the sons of Aaron as a high priest for my service. Exodus 40, 33 describes how Moses completed the tabernacle. The Hebrew text exactly parallels the account of how God finished creation. Genesis Rabbah comments, it is as if on that day, the day the tabernacle was finished, I actually created the world, end of quote. Donald Perry has argued that the Garden of Eden can be seen as a natural temple, where Adam and Eve lived in God's presence for a time and mirroring the configuration of the heavenly temple intended as their ultimate destination. Quoting Perry, anciently, once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, Adam's eastward expansion out of the Garden of Eden uh, is reversed when the high priest traveled west, past the consuming fire of sacrifice and the purifying water of the laver, through the veil woven with images of cherubim. Thus he returned to the original point of creation where he poured out the atoning blood of the sacrifice, reestablishing the covenant of God. In modern temples, the posterity of Adam and Eve likewise traced the footsteps of their first parents, both away from Eden and then in a journey of return and reunion. About the journey made within the temple, Nibley comments, properly speaking, one did not go through the temple, in one door and out the other. For one enters and leaves by the same door, but by, leaving in, but by moving in opposite directions. It is in this sense that we can consider the whole collection of stories assembled in Moses 2 through 8 to constitute a walk in the garden. The tree of life is the most significant object in the Garden of Eden. Its presence has always been somewhat of a puzzle to students of the Bible, however, because it is only briefly mentioned in Genesis, once at the beginning of the story, in connection with the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and once at the end, when the cherubim and a flaming, flaming sword is placed to guard Adam and Eve from taking of its fruit. For this and other reasons, some scholars have concluded that there was originally only one special tree, the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden story, and the tree of life was added later as an afterthought. This view is, of course, mistaken, as will be argued a little later. Sometimes sacred trees are associated with the human king or with the mother of a king, whether human or divine. Catherine Thomas noted that most often in scripture, the tree is an anthropomorphic strip, script symbol. A tree serves well as such a symbol because it has, after all, limbs, a circulatory system, the bearing of fruit, and so forth. Specifically, scriptural trees often stand for Christ and his attributes. Nicholas Wyatt concurs, adding, the menorah is probably what Moses is understood to have seen as the burning bush in Exodus 3. Thus, Jehovah, the premortal Jesus Christ, was represented to Moses as one who dwells in the midst of the burning glory of the tree of life. As an aside, Barker sees evidence that the first temple tree of life was symbolized within the Holy of Holies. By way of contrast, most depictions of Jewish temple architecture show a menorah as being outside the veil. Could there have been a depiction of the tree of life in both places? In any case, Barker concludes that the menorah was removed from the temple and diminished in stature in later Jewish literature as the result of a very ancient feud concerning its significance, about which we'll speak today. 
Ancient commentators often identify the tree of life with the olive tree. Its extremely long life makes it a fitting symbol for eternal life, and its everyday use of the oil is a source of both nourishment and light, uh, and it uh, evokes natural associations when used in conjunction with the ritual anointing of priests and kings and with the healing of the sick. On the other hand, the, sacred, the date palm is the sacred tree in Assyrian mythology, and its longevity was a fitting symbol for long life to the Egyptians. This mural from 1750 BCE, writes J.R. Porter, strikingly recalls de details of the Genesis description of the Garden of Eden. In particular, the mural depicts two types of tree, the one on the right clearly being a date palm, the other being another type of tree, hard to identify. Guarded by mythical wind winged animals, the Syrian version of the cherubim. You see them to the side of one of the trees. The lower half of the central pattern panel shows figures holding jars from which flow four streams, and a seedling growing out of the middle, recalling the streams that flow out from underneath the tree of life in the garden. The streams originate in a basement room which might be seen as providing an ideal setting for ritual washings. The upper scene may depict a king being invested by the Mesopotamian fertility god Ishtar. Eve has been associated with such figures. Note the king's right hand raised, perhaps in an oath-related gesture. His outstretched left arm receives the crown and staff of his office. In favor of the date palm as a representation of the tree of life, in contrast to the olive tree, are the Book of Mormon accounts of Nehi, Lehi and Nephi's visions. Other sources specifically associate the date palm with the motifs of kingship, wisdom, the mother of a divine child, and the cosmos itself. Lehi himself contrasts the fruit of the tree of life, the sweet fruit of the tree of life, to the fruit of the forbidden tree, the one being sweet and the other bitter. The fruit of the date palm, often described as white in its most desirable varieties, well known to Lehi's family, likely available in the Valley of Lemuel where the family was camped at the time of the vision, would have provided a more fitting analog than the olive tree to the love of God that was sweet above all that is sweet. Here is a 12th century drawing of two scenes from the Garden of Eden. At the left is Eve who is being created from Adam's rib, and at the right is God given at giving Adam and Eve a commandment not to partake of the fruit of tree of knowledge. Anderson points out an interesting divergence between the Genesis story and the drawing featured here. Whereas Genesis 2 recounts that Adam was created first, given a commandment, and only then received a spouse, the illustration has it that Adam was created, then Eve was drawn from his rib, and finally both were given the commandment. At right, God gestures toward the tree of knowledge in warning as he takes Adam firmly by the wrist. At the same time, Eve raises her arm in what seems a gesture of consent to God's commandment. An interesting feature of the tree, is the, of the tree of life in the middle of the drawing is that it has sprouted human faces resembling Adam and Eve. This idea attests to the Jewish and Christian traditions about individual premortal existence. The tree of souls, which in Jewish legend represented the heavenly tree of life, was thought to produce new souls which ripen and then fall from the tree into the treasury of souls in paradise. There the soul is stored until the angel Gabriel reaches into the treasury and takes out the first that come into his hand so it can be born into mortality. One thing that has always perplexed students of Genesis is the location of the two trees in Eden. The Hebrew phrase corresponding to in the midst means literally in the center. Although scripture apply, specifically applies the phrase in the midst only to the tree of life, the tree of knowledge is later said by Eve to have been located there too. A brief review of the symbolism of the center in ancient thought will help clarify the important roles that the tree of knowledge and the tree of life and the tree of knowledge played in the midst of the Garden of Eden. In ancient Israel, the holiest spot on earth was believed to, the foundation, to be the foundation stone in front of the Ark of the Covenant within the temple at Jerusalem. John Lundquist cites a famous passage in the Midrash Tanhuma to this effect. Just as the navel is found at the center of a human being, so the land of Israel is found at the center of the world. Jerusalem is at the center of the land of Israel, and the temple is the center of Jerusalem. The Holy of Holies is at the center of the temple, the ark at the center of the Holy of Holies, and the foundation stone is in front of the ark, which spot is the foundation of the world, the place where creation commenced. Incidentally, for the Muslims, this is, of course, Mecca, rather than Jerusalem. When symbolized, often symbolizes a cosmic tree, the temple originates in the underworld below the earth, stands on the earth as a meeting place, and yet towers architecturally into the heavens and gives access to the heavens through its ritual. 
In this beautiful, fun photograph by Lindquist, a structure of sacred stones emerging from the surrounding waters evokes a similar tranquility charged with divine force. In the symbolism of the sacred center, the circle is often used to represent heaven while the square represents earth. The photo at left here shows the sacred mosque of Mecca during the peak period of the Hajj. As part of the ritual of Tawaf, Hajj pilgrims enact the symbolism of the circle by encircling um, the square altar, the Kaaba, as they form concentric rings um, around it and pray. Islamic tradition says that near this place, Adam had been shown the worship place of the angels, and he was directly above the Kaaba, in, which was directly above the Kaaba in heaven, and that he was commanded to build a house for God in Mecca, where he could, in likeness of the angels, circamp circambulate, circumambulate, yes, circumambulate around this altar and offer prayer. At right, we see Doré's famous illustration, the Empyrean Heaven. This is a representation of the highest heaven, a circular realm of pure fire. The heavenly throne in the world of, word of Lehi is surrounded by, by num numerous, numberless concourses of angels in the attitude of singing and praising God. The representation of the heaven as concentric circles can be contrasted with the figure of the intersecting circle and square, the latter combination symbolizing the coming together of heaven and earth in both the temple and the soul of the seeker of wisdom. Ultimately, however, the sacred center does not represent some abstract epitome of goodness, nor merely a ceremonial altar or throne, but deity himself is shown in this image. The center is the most holy place, and the degree of holiness decreases in proportion to the distance from the center. For example, Kent Brown observes how at its first appearance to the Nephites, Jesus stood in the midst of them and cites other Book of Mormon passages associating the presence of the Lord in the midst to the placement of the temple and its altar. He also noted a similar configuration when Jesus blessed the Nephite children. Quote, as the most holy one, the Savior was standing in the midst at the sacred center. The children sat upon the ground around him. When the angels came down, they encircled those little ones about. In their place next to the children, the angels, angels themselves were encircled with fire. On the edge stood the adults, and beyond them was what we might turn the, the profane space which stretched away from this holy center." End of quote. Jesus' placement of the children so they immediately surrounded him, their proximity exceeding even that of the encircling angels and accompanying fire, conveyed a powerful visual message about their holiness, na namely that whosoever shall humble himself as a little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Hence Jesus' instructions to them, Behold your little ones. Going back to the tree of life, elaborate explanations have been advanced as attempts to describe how both the tree of life and the tree of knowledge could share the center of the garden. For example, it's been suggested that the two trees were in reality different aspects of a single tree, or that they shared a common trunk, or were somehow intertwined. This detail from a 14th century drawing by Lutwin shows the tree of life and the tree of knowledge standing, both standing at the center of their garden with their branches intertwined. The subtle conflation of the location of the two trees in the Genesis account seems intentional, preparing readers for the confusion that later ensues in the dialogue with the serpent. The dramatic irony of the story is heightened by the fact that while the reader is informed about both trees, Adam and Eve are only specifically told about the tree of knowledge. Satan will exploit their ignorance to his advantage. Perhaps the most interesting tradition about the placement of the two trees is the idea that the foliage of the tree of knowledge hid the tree of life from direct view, and that, quote, God did not specifically prohibit eating from the tree of life because the tree of knowledge formed a hedge around it. Only after one, ha only after one had partaken of the latter and cleared a path for himself could one come close to the tree of life. It is in the same sense that Ephraim the Syrian, a brilliant, devoted, fourth-century Christian, could call the tree of knowledge the veil for the sanctuary, the tree of life having been planted in an inner place so holy that Adam and Eve would court mortal danger if they entered unprepared. Though God could minister to them in the garden, they could not safely enter his world. Speaking in a similar spirit, Elder Bruce C. Hafen has explained that, quote, the mortal learning experience represented by the tree of knowledge is so necessary that God placed cherubim and a flaming sword to guard the way of the tree of life until Adam and Eve completed, and we their posterity complete, this preparatory schooling. 
God cannot fully receive us and give us the gift of celestial life, partaking of his very nature, until we have learned by our own experience to distinguish good and evil. Ephraim the Syrian's detailed description of the segmented layout of Eden parallels the division of the animals on Noah's Ark and the demarcations on Sinai, separating Moses, Aaron, and the priests and the people. For now, we'll only discuss the leftmost column. Here, he depicts paradise as a great mountain with the tree of knowledge providing a boundary partway up the slopes. The tree of knowledge, he concludes, acts as a sanctuary curtain or veil hiding the Holy of Holies, which is the tree of life higher up. Significantly, a Gnostic text describes the color of the tree of life, life as being, quote, like the sun, while the glory of the tree of knowledge is said to be, quote, like the moon. Similarly, an Armenian Christian text records the belief that, quote, the tree of good and evil is the knowledge of material things, referring to the kind of knowledge that was made possible when Adam and Eve put, partook of the fruit, and that the tree of knowledge, quote, is the knowledge of divine things, which were not profitable to the simple understanding of Adam, at least not until he had successfully passed through the experience of mortality. For those who took the tree of life to represent the to be a representation of the Holy of Holies, it was natural to see the tree as the locus of God's throne. As Tergi Stordalen explains, the garden at the center of which stands the throne of glory is the royal audience room, which only those admitted to the sovereign's presence can enter. It is the appointed place for the meeting between God and the people who come before him. In the garden, God talks to Adam, and in the garden, he waits for the souls who come back to him." End of quote. Consistent with this illustration, we see an Islamic legend maintains that Adam and Eve, as God's vice regents on the earth, were permitted to reign on his behalf from a throne in Eden until the moment of their transgression. Quote, in the midst of paradise, there stood a green silken tent supported on golden pillars, and in the midst of it, there was a throne on which Adam seated himself with Eve, whereupon the curtains of the tent closed around them of their own accord. Although the idea of a second co-located tree is not usually mentioned in Islamic traditions concerning Adam and Eve, although I've, interestingly enough, I've found some references now, note that the function of the curtains in the description was, of course, to screen the view from public sight, screen the throne from public sight, just as the tree of knowledge veiled the view from the tree of life in Ephraim's depiction of Eden. A Manichaean wall painting from East Turkestan depicts a sacred tree with three trunks. The symbolism of the three trunks in Manichaean iconography, iconography, iconography may be connected to the three sons of Noah whom the whole, of whom the whole earth was overspread. The story of Noah's family after the flood has often been compared to the first chapters of Genesis. Immediately after their debarkation, God established his covenant with them, outlining dietary instructions and giving the commandment to multiply and replenish the earth, just as he'd given to Adam and Eve. The ever-obedient Noah also imitated the example of the first parents by at once beginning to till the earth. Then come the scene, comes the scene of a fall and consequent judgment. Often the instigator of this fall is wrongfully seen to be Noah, who it is reported succumbed to the intoxicating influence of the wine from his vineyard and retreated to the privacy of his tent. Note, however, that the scriptures omit any hint of wrongdoing by Noah and instead reserve all condemnation for his son Ham and his grandson Canaan. And what was their sin? If we've understood the situation in Eden correctly, it is a perfect parallel to the per transgression of Adam and Eve. Without proper invitation, Ham approached the curtains of his father's tent and intrusively looked within, violating Noah's sanctity and uncovering what should have been left unseen. While the battle begins, in the pre battle begun in the premortal councils and waged again in the garden was a test of obedience for Adam and Eve, it should be remembered that the actual prize at stake was knowledge, the knowledge required for them to be saved and ultimately to be exalted. The prophet taught that the principle of knowledge is the principle of salvation. Therefore, quote, anyone that cannot get knowledge to be saved will be damned, end of quote. This raises a conundrum. Since salvation was to come through knowledge, why did Satan encourage rather than prevent the eating of the forbidden fruit by Adam and Eve? It is evidence that their trans evident that their transgression must have been as much an important part of the devil's strategy as it was a central feature of the Father's plan. The difference in intention between God and Satan was apparent, however, when it came for Adam and Eve to take the next step. In this regard, the scriptures seem to suggest that the adversary wanted Adam and Eve to eat the fruit of the tree of life directly after they took of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, a danger which moved God to take immediate preventive action. 
For had God and had Adam and Eve eaten of the fruit of the tree of life at that time, as the prophet Alma said, quote, there would have been no death, no space granted unto men in which he might repent, in other words, no probationary state to prepare for a final judgment and resurrection. It is easy to see a parallel between Satan's initial proposal in the spirit world and his later strategy to frustrate the plan of salvation through his actions in Eden. Just as this defeated pre-mortal plan had proposed to provide a limited measure of salvation for all by precluding the opportunity for exaltation, so it seems plausible that his unsuccessful scheme in the garden was intended to impose an inferior, inferior form of immortality that would forestall the possibility of eternal life. However, because the devil, quote, knew not the mind of God, his efforts to destroy the world would be in vain. The result of his deceitful manipulations to get Adam and Eve to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge was co-opted by God, and the risk of Adam and Eve's partaking immediately of the fruit of the tree of life was averted by the merciful placement of the placement of the tree of the cherubim and the flaming sword. The Father did intend eventually for Adam and Eve to partake of the tree of life but not until they had learned through mortal experience to distinguish good from evil. Having selectively examined some of the ancient perspectives that might shed life on the context of the story of the, of the fall of Adam and Eve, we're now ready to return to the account itself as given in the book of Moses chapter four. The serpent is described as subtle. The Hebrew term behind the word thus depicts it as shrewd, cunning, and crafty, but not as wise. Subtle in this context also has to do with the ability to make something appear one way when it is actually another. Thus it will not be in the least out of character later for Satan both to disguise his identity and to distort the true nature of a situation in order to deceive. The painting shows the tempter in the dual guise of a serpent and a woman whose hair and facial features exactly mirror those of Eve. This common form of portrayal was not intended to assert that the woman was devilish, but rather to depict the devil as trying to allay Eve's fears, deceptively appealing to her by appearing in a form that resembled her own. Of more significance here is the fact that the serpent is a frequently used symbol of Christ and his life-giving power. In the context of the temptation of Eve, Draper et al. conclude that Satan has, quote, effectively come as the Messiah offering a promise that only the Messiah can offer, for it is the Messiah who will control the powers of life and death and can promise life, not Satan." End of quote. Not only has the devil come in the guise of the Holy One, but he has chosen to appear in a very sacred place in the garden. If it is true, as Ephraim the Syrian believed, that the tree of knowledge was a figure for the veil of the sanctuary, then Satan has positioned himself in an extreme of sacrilegious effrontery as the very keeper of the gate. What was the nature of the forbidden fruit? Recalling an Egyptian version of the story which revolved around the presumption of the hero Setni in taking the book of knowledge which was guarded by the endless serpent, Nibley noted that a book of knowledge is certainly more logical than a tree of knowledge. In fact, Islamic legend insists on the idea that Satan was condemned for his claims that he would reveal knowledge of certain things to Adam and Eve. He is portrayed as recruiting his accomplices, the vain peacock and the wise and, and the fair and prudent serpent, by deceptively promising them that he would reveal to them three mysterious words which would preserve them from sickness, age, and death. Having by this means won over the serpent, Satan then directly equates the effect of knowing these secret words with the eating of the forbidden fruit by promising the same protection from death to Eve as she will but partake. Nibley elaborates, quote, Satan disobeyed orders when he revealed certain secrets to Adam and Eve, but not because they were not known and done in other worlds, but because he was not authorized in that time and place to give them. Although Satan had given the fruit to Adam and Eve, it was not his prerogative to do so, regardless of what had been done in other worlds. When the time comes for such fruit, it will be given to us legitimately." End of quote. At the moment of temptation, Satan deliberately tries to confuse Eve. The devil and the reader of scripture know that there are two trees in the midst of the garden, but only one of them is visible to Eve. Moreover, as Margaret Barker explains, quote, he made the two trees seem identical. The tree of knowledge of good and evil would open her eyes and she would be like God, knowing both good and evil. Almost the same was true of the tree of life, for wisdom opened the eyes of those, of those who ate her fruit, and as they became wise, they became divine, end of quote. The plausibility of the theme of confusion between the two trees in the record of Moses is strengthened by its appearance in extra-canonical accounts. 
For example, in the Quran, Satan does more than simply say that Eve will not suffer death if she eats the forbidden fruit. Instead, he makes the false claim that it is, quote, the tree of immortality. However, in rea reality, the tree was just the opposite of what he stated it to be, quote, it was the tree of death, the spiritual death of man, end of quote. Following their transgression, we are told that Adam and Eve made aprons from fig leaves. The fruit of the fig tree is known for its abundance of seeds. Thus, an apron of green fig leaves is an appropriate symbol for Adam's and Eve's ability to procreate, to be fruitful and multiply after the fall. Ostensibly, the aprons function to hide their nak nakedness. But is there more to the story than this? Aprons have long been used in ritual contexts to represent power and authority. For example, a sacred tree was symbolically represented in an apron worn by the 8th century Christian Saint King Charlemagne is this figure which was included in Matt Brown's valuable volume. Kings in the Middle East were often represented as various sorts of trees. In Egypt and Mesoamerica, foli foliated aprons were used as a sign of authority. In Moses 427, God will be, himself will be the one to clothe Adam and Eve, whereas in verse 13 we are told that Adam and Eve, quote, made themselves aprons. Like their tasting of the forbidden fruit, this action exemplifies the recurring theme of the attempt and failure of human effort in obtaining a blessing that only God can give. It is perfectly in character for Satan to have planted the suggestion of making aprons, since he often appropriates false signs of power and priesthoods for himself in order to deceive. Note that this is Satan's third attempt to mislead Adam and Eve by false appearances. First, he appeared as a serpent, deceptively employing a symbol of Christ. Second, he made claims that confused the identities of the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. Finally, in the episode of the fig leaf aprons, he suggested a course of action to Adam and Eve that substituted a self-made emblem of power and priesthood for the true article obtainable only when authorized by God. When Adam and Eve heard the voice of the Lord, the English text says that they went to hide themselves in the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. However, this is a mistranslation, since the Hebrew for tree is singular in this verse, an important subtlety glossed over in nearly every vernacular edition of the Bible. As a rare exception, André Chouriquy's French translation holds to a strict rendering of the key phrase describing Adam and Eve's place of concealment in the center of, i.e. within, the tree of the garden. As Kastler observes, they are not merely touching the tree of knowledge, but they have, for all intents and purposes, merged with it. The tree has become their refuge, or perhaps their prison, end of quote. They have experienced a kind of death. The image of the guilty parties, Adam and Eve, being figuratively shut up in a tree recalls Egyptian motifs, such as the one evoked by the figure of Ramses II as, as Osiris, shown here. Nibley also mentions the Book of the Dead vignette showing the lady incorporated all but her upper part, in many cases all but her arms only, in the fruit-bearing tree, suggesting that the woman in the tree must have all actually been eaten by it. She is the first victim, so to speak, and now invites her male companion to share her condition." End of quote. Thus, in ancient year rites in Egypt, the splitting of the tree both terminates life and liberates it, allowing the captive initiate to be reborn. The splitting of the tree is also said to represent among other things, the splitting of good and evil, or the law of opposites. An Islamic tradition likewise re relates that, quote, Adam went inside the tree to hide, end of quote, recalling Al-Talabi's version of the story of the martyrdom of Isaiah. As in Egyptian texts, pseudepigraphal accounts report that Isaiah's death in a split tree was immediately followed by his rebirth and ascension to heaven, a motif also found in ancient New World texts as I learned from reading Brant Gardner's excellent book on the Book of Moses, on the Book of Mormon. This figure comes from a hieroglyphic funerary papyrus of the royal scribe and chief military officer who lived in the fourth century BCE. The guide Anubis leads the deceased one by the hand. They approach a tree that stands before the false door, signifying the entrance to the other world. To reach that door, they must pass by, or perhaps more accurately, through the tree. The elaborate preparations for the candidate for admission had made during life and after death were all to the end of making this passage to the next life successful. Western art typically portrays Adam and Eve as naked in the garden and dressed in coats of skin after the fall. However, orthodox tradition depicts the sequence of the change in clothing in reverse manner. How can that be? The Eastern Church remembers that the accounts 
that portray Adam as king and priest in Eden. So naturally, he is shown there in regal robes. On the other hand, Orthodox exegetes interpret the skins that the couple wore after their expulsion from garden as being their own human flesh. Anderson takes this to mean that, quote, Adam has exchanged an angelic constitution for a mortal one, a terrestrial glory for a telestial one. Rabbinical writings describe how in likeness of Adam and Eve, each soul descending to earth divests itself of its heavenly garden, garment and is clothed in a garment of flesh and blood, end of quote, the prior glory being, as it were, veiled in flesh. The various afflictions of mortality initial, initially given to Adam are now bestowed upon all men and women, and frequently numbering seven, quote, they are against the seven natures, the flesh for hearing, the eyes for seeing, the breath to smell, the veins to touch, the blood for taste, the bones for endurance, the intelligence for joy, or against life, sight, hearing, smell, taste, procreation. Though Adam and Eve were protected from mortal harm at the time of their extremity, Satan had been allowed to hurt them, and we are told that the wounds made by these blows of death remained on their bodies. Christian tradition preserves a memory of Adam's intense suffering from these wounds as he approached death and of the efforts of Seth and Eve to relieve his anguish. They prayed to God that, quote, he might send his angel to give them some oil from the tree of his mercy to anoint Adam on account of the pains of his body, the blows of death. Eventually, with the branch from the tree of the Garden of Eden, Seth received the promise that the oil of mercy will flow for mankind through the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Likewise, early Christians wrote of being anointed in all parts of the body with oil from the tree of life in imitation of Adam, and afterwards being, quote, vested with the token of the garments he or she shall enjoy at the resurrection, end of quote. The story in, shown in the sculpture is preserved at the Holy Cross Münster in uh, Germany, a town I won't try to pronounce. Following the description of Asaph Pincus, Adam lies on the ground on his sick bed, sick bed supporting his head in his hands. Eve sits behind him, her right hand grips his shoulder while her left is held to her breast, exhibiting her storm of emotions. Behind them, one can see a sprouting tree. To their right, Seth receives a branch from an angel standing at the entrance to a Gothic structure symbolizing paradise. Inside the canopy is a tree. Seth is almost an abstract figure existing exclusively to perform his mission to fetch for mankind God's gift of mercy. Thus, Seth represents Christ himself, and these scenes of Eve's mourning over the death of Adam and Seth's journey to paradise can be seen as prefigurations of the Pieta and the crucifixion. We've now come nearly to the end of our walk in the garden. However, a question raised early, earlier has not yet been resolved. Is the tree of life more usefully thought as and representing an olive tree or a date palm? At least some ancient interpreters might have answered both. Reconciling the competing idea of a tree of life that bears sweet fruit, like the date, as opposed to an oil-producing fruit, like the olive tree, is a Gnostic suggestion that the garden story was concerned with three special trees rather than two. In addition to the original tree of life and tree of knowledge, the third tree, an olive tree, is said to have sprouted up only after the sin of Adam when a savior was mercifully provided for him. In Christian imagery, a related idea was often visually represented by a cruciform tree flanked by two small identical trees from the Garden of Eden. The centrally depicted tree of mercy, said in other sources to have been planted by Seth over the grave of Adam, would be destined to bear the fruit of the crucified Christ. Thus, in a sense, there were two trees of life, the original Edenic eschatological tree with its sweet fruit that was represented within the Holy of Holies and subsequently sprouted oil-bearing tree of mercy that stood in front of the veil, the latter being a symbol of the Savior. Adam, uh, in a larger sense, the olive tree of mercy also, might also be seen as representing the whole house of Israel, whose mission it is to help carry out the Savior's work of gathering and blessing all the nations of the earth, what Truman G. Madsen describes as the messianic calling appointed to all those who receive the Messiah. The primary function of the olive tree was evidently viewed as being to supply the requisite oil for an atoning anointing of healing and sanctification. It was seen as a secondary tree of life in the sense that the Savior's power could reverse the blows of death to which Adam previously had been subjected. Our choices parallel those faced by Adam and Eve. 
Though we have all succumbed to Satan's deception and taken of the tree of knowledge, as Romans 5.14 says, quote, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, Jesus Christ, our redeeming tree of life, supplies the requisite healing oil of, an, of healing and light, what Hebrews calls the oil of gladness, to all those who accept him as their redeemer. As the only true keeper of the gate, he lovingly welcomes the faithful back into the presence of the Father, where the original Edenic tree of life, bearing the sweet fruit of the tree of eternal life and the fullness of the love of God, is found. And in the end, all three trees will indeed become one. Thank you. Oh, what do you make of the passage in the Book of Mormon, Book of Moses, that reads, The first man of all men have I called Adam, which is many. Uh, there are three different interpretations of this. Uh, one is, if I can remember the three, some of you may be able to help me here. One is, of course, that Adam is the first man in each world that God has created, is given the name as a role of Adam, and there are many worlds. Another is simply that Adam is the first man and there are many uh, men who have come after him. Those are the two main ones, I believe. Okay. Do you view the JST as a restoration of the original biblical text or as more new commentary or something else? That's a very good question. I think um, Philip Barlow probably answered that best in his book on Mormonism and the Bible, and he outlined six different types of changes that were made uh, in the JST. To me, it seems like they run the gamut. No one could say that, it, that Moses I and the material on Enoch, for example, is anything other than a very inspired, revelatory expansion of those texts came directly from, uh, from uh, the revelation of Joseph Smith and not from any revision of an existing text, although perhaps Enoch kept his own record. On the other hand, there are other cases where um, Joseph Smith clearly went in and made common sense changes to clarify the meaning of, of the words as he saw it. So I think it runs the gamut, and uh, you can make your own choice as you read which things came about just to clarify the common sense meaning of things and which things were revelatory expansions. Wow, you're flowing in. Near the beginning of your presentation, you showed an image of the layout of the garden compared to the layout of the temple. Where did this image came from? come from? I believe it's the book, it's one of the, the farms volumes, Temples of the Ancient World, or um, That's is that the one? Okay, so there's an article by uh, Donald Perry in there that, that has those things. Actually, I think it was by a book by Holtzapfel, however you say his name, earlier used by that, but Michael Lyon did that drawing, and you can find it in that book. Very good article. Thanks for coming. By the way, no, I was talking to you, Kevin. Good to see you. <laughs> Since the holy place corresponds to the terrestrial kingdom, could this be a potential way to allow people in the temple who do not yet qualify for the celestial area? Room, area? Well, um, I don't want to get too far out in speculation here, but uh, I will just say that it's been documented that Brigham Young uh, at one point speculated about the idea of giving members of the church only partial amounts of the endowment, saying that not everybody was ready for the full endowment, and so he, there was some discussion about the fact whether or not some people could go to a certain people, point of the, of, the, uh, of the ordinance, and other people could go beyond. That's as much as I'll say about that. What are the sexual connotations of the trees and the fruit of Ham uncovering his father's nakedness? Well, I, I discuss this quite a bit at the book. Uh, as far as Ham, uh, the scholars that I tend to agree with, um, really discount the idea of Ham's uncovering his father's nakedness as having any sexual connotation. I think reading in the 20th century, that's probably the first thing that occurs to our minds. We don't have the same context the ancient readers did. Uh, similarly, in terms of the trees, I have, there are some ancient accounts that uh, connect either um, sexual connotations to Eve and Satan or Adam and Eve connected with the Garden of Eden story. Again, the most reliable commentators, uh, in my opinion, have tended to discount those possibilities. Again, you can uh, read in the book a little bit more and determine yourself who you agree with and inform me if you come up with a better conclusion. I thought the menorah was a figure of the almond tree. Which is it? 
Olives, figs, almonds, or all of the above? Well, nobody really knows, of course. Um, I think many LDS scholars, at least, have tended to think of it as being an olive tree, partly because the olive tree is associated with the source of light. Olive oil was used in the menorah uh, to produce that light. And of course, the imagery of the temple uh, and, and, and so much of scripture has to do with olives. The, the almonds, I think, are often associated with um, more of what goes on in the Holy of Holies. And there's a whole other discussion having to do with uh, what was in the ark and so forth, having to do with that. Um, but you can find all kinds of things uh, proposed for those trees. This is just one idea of what some ancient exegetes might have thought. I'm not certain whether it's the only one, but I thought it was an interesting one to bring up in sort of conjectural mode here. So don't take anything I said today as conjectural. I sort of brought up some things that I thought uh, would be interesting and a little controversial maybe as opposed to some things that might be more settled and less interesting. Did Adam know that it was impossible to keep both commandments, multiply and replenish, and do not eat of the tree? You know, I'll just say about this, there are some LDS writers nowadays that take sort of our feelings about the goodness of Adam and Eve to such an extent they don't feel there was any deception of Eve or any deception of Adam in the garden. Um, that could certainly be the case. None of us knows. They could have done everything in a very knowing thing and just followed it forward. The scriptural text, though, as I read it, if we take this text as it is, the book of Moses, the Genesis, and the temple story, to me, all seem to indicate there's some deception involved, which involved a transgression by Eve. Adam, although possibly most likely having his eyes open when he made his choice, also said some very unflattering things, in my opinion, about Eve, and so maybe his heart wasn't even right about the situation. What, what the truth is, I don't think we know, but my view is not as extreme as those who believe that Adam and Eve just mechanically went through the motions of doing what they knew they should do all along. I think that there was some interesting deception, transgression, and the choice was really a real choice in Eden and not just a mechanical choice of choosing the good. Is the JST more a correction of the text or more greater insight and inspired commentary? I think we talked about that. I think it runs the gamut between those two extremes. Why has all the JST not been canonized? Um, who was I hearing about this from? I heard this from somebody who was on the committee uh, the last year or two who said that one of the big reasons was just simply that they had a hard time squeezing in as many footnotes as they had in there. I don't know if that's the only reason, but uh, part of it was clearly for practical reasons. I think there was also some feeling on the committee, I would guess, uh, from, again, relying on my memory of what I heard, that uh, some portions were just simple clarifications and other portions were very valuable, deliberate inspiration. So there's some difference, perhaps, in the value of different parts of the JST. I don't want to put myself in the position of deciding what those are, but I think some have done that. Um, can you give one example of a false scripture corrected by the JST? Well, I could, I could defer to Kevin Barney there on the, the New Testament. Uh, there, there's some interesting things there. Uh, I would say that it's not so much false scripture being corrected, but a lot of interesting context being added back. Again, I didn't say anything about chapter 1 and 5 through 8 of the book of Moses today. But Moses 1, I, I, I heard a lot of very, it's never been examined in the kind of detail it should have been done. When you examine the cryptic language and some of the very hard to understand passages and some of the parallels, it's very clear that this is an ascent text, a very clear pattern uh, to other uh, texts of a similar nature of people going to heaven. And the parallels to the Testament of Abraham and some of the other things and to the modern endowment ceremony are striking. It's a very fitting conclusion then that as we fall Adam and Eve out of the garden in Moses 2, 3, 4, we have another pattern that shows up in 5 through 8 in my opinion. Again, you can go to the book to get my opinion on that. Similar to those of you who may have read uh, Jack, Jack Welch's book on the Sermon at the Mount and the Sermon at the Temple or David Friedman's book, The Nine Commandments, where the same covenants that are given in every temple are given not only uh, in that three chapter period, but in the correct order. For example, the word, the gospel, shows up only twice in uh, chapters five through eight, or all of the book of Moses, and it shows up just where you would expect it to show up. 
So that context of what that story really means to me is the most valuable contr contribution of the, of the JST, at least in the book of Moses. Please expand on Joseph Smith's understanding of the word translation. I feel totally incompetent to do that. Those of you who, who have studied his own words about the translation process know that he just said, I did it by the gift and power of God. And then all we have in addition to that statement, he said nothing more about it. Oh, he said, it's not, what did he say? It's not um, a very, an appropriate thing or, or uh, it's, it's not something I wish to comment on. It's not good for me to give the particulars of the translation. And then he never gave them. So all we have is third hand, second hand and third hand accounts of the translation. I wish I knew uh, there's some translation that I'd like to do someday. And uh, when I find out how that works, I'll let you know.